South Korea in collective shock and grief after the Halloween crowd crush that killed at least 155 people. As details of the fatal incident in Itaewon emerge, concerns are that the indiscriminate sharing of photos and videos could lead to a wider fallout on the mental health of the public. Authorities are urging people to stop circulating the images and to refrain from making hate comments online. But for a deeper look into the tragedy and uh, how the dissemination of these graphic materials could affect mental health, we're joined by Alison Holman. She's a professor of psychological science at University of California, Irvine. Professor, um, first of all, give us a sense of the kind of mental impact this incident will have on family members, witnesses, and the first responders and, and, and survivors of the tragedy. Well, it's very likely that people who were there, uh, many people who were there will experience symptoms of um, stress, post-traumatic stress type symptoms. Many will have those symptoms and they will go away within a short period of time, but some others, those symptoms may last a little bit longer. Um, yeah, so those are some of the symptoms I would expect to see. Uh, but with the, you mentioned the graphic media, more graphic media exposure, the more they look at pictures of what happened online or through social media, the more exposure they have to those kinds of pictures, the greater likelihood is that they're going to have those acute stress or post-traumatic stress type symptoms in the early aftermath. And how does the nature of this tragedy impact the emotional and mental health of survivors? We've read accounts, uh, one for example, a survivor locking eyes with a victim in the crush and feeling helpless as he watched her suffocate and die. Yeah, that's that's a uh, you know the when you see something live happen like that, whether it's uh, live in person or live via the media, that can be very very um, harmful because it's very real and it's you know reflects to us what our our experience of our own mortality and so having that happen could raise all kinds of feelings. For example, of guilt. Um, of remorse uh, that can come up if a person has has that kind of experience uh, during an event like that. You briefly mentioned social media, and it's certainly become more prominent these days. It's nearly impossible to avoid unblurred images and videos being shared in near real time. Professor, tell us what are the risks and dangers of sharing these distressing media content of the crowd crush incident, also uh, watching such scenes or news excessively? Yes, our, re our research shows very clearly that the more you expose yourself to media coverage of such events, and the more you expose yourself to graphic images of the that kind of uh, experience, um, you're more likely to have post-traumatic stress symptoms. What do I mean when I say post-traumatic stress symptoms? I'm talking about experiences of re-experiencing the event over and over, maybe having intrusive thoughts about them, avoiding, trying to avoid every, anything that reminds you of it, feeling hypervigilant. Um, those kinds of symptoms are very, very common among people who have had such an experience. And as I said, the media, as the amount of media that you engage in and the content of that media, both matter in terms of how strong those symptoms are for you. So I strongly encourage people not to engage with too much media content, to refrain from seeing the images in particular. I encourage media companies to put up warnings to people before they show them graphic videos so that they know or graphic pictures so that people know this is graphic and they can make a choice as to whether or not they want to look at it. That, those are some of the things that people can do to protect the mental health of others. Now we've also seen another crowd related tragedy take place in India where a bridge collapsed killing 134 people. The emotional fallout mm -hmm. there will be similar, won't it? Do details of the differences matter? Um, I think when, when you see such different events, a lot of what we are looking at in terms of what's gonna matter for a person's uh, own mental health is what their prior life experiences are. So what kinds of experiences did they have growing up? Did they lose somebody in either of these tragedies? How close are they to it? And, and again, how much media exposure are they exposing themselves to? Perhaps somebody that's used to traveling on that bridge a lot 
may feel uh, guilt or remorse because they ended up not being on the on the bridge that time, but somebody they knew was on the bridge and died. There's a lot of very important different factors that that weigh in on how much a person is going to respond to such events. And I think one thing that's really important for everybody to remember is there's no one way for people to respond to such events. It's not that everybody is distressed or that everybody isn't distressed. It's there's a such a wide range and there's going to be a, a vast array of different ways that people will respond with mental health symptoms to these kinds of events, largely because people come to those events with a very wide array of background experiences. What kind of experiences have they had in the past? What kind of traumas have they had in the past? Those things matter in terms of whether a person has a strong response or not. And Professor, so how can the, the government or individuals or the broader community, uh, what can they do to provide support to help the country collectively heal uh, from the shocking incident? That's a fantastic question. It's really important in events like this for people to engage as much as they can, as best you can, to reach out and try to help somebody in your neighborhood. Taking steps to providing support for somebody else is not only good for them, but it's good for you too. That kind of pro-social engagement that people have is really good for your mental health, it's good for your physical health, but it's also really good for building a community and having a sense of social responsibility for making sure that your country, that your community can take, can move on and, and find a way to heal. It's important not to push people to have to move on immediately, but to give people space to be able to have a place where they can feel safe talking about their experiences if they want to talk, to not force people to talk if they don't want to talk. These are important factors to consider, but definitely taking some responsibility for trying to reach out and, and talk to people in your community and provide a little bit of support for people in your community. The government can help by trying to provide resources to the city, to the people, to the families who have lost somebody, provide resources in terms of providing mental health, early mental health interventions that um, if the people want them, it's very important to remember if somebody doesn't feel like they need a mental health intervention, you should not force something upon them. But doing those kinds of things is really important to help people heal. Professor, thank you so much for your time this morning. We'll leave it there. Professor Dr. Alison Holman, Professor of Psychological Science at the University of California, Irvine.